within your marriage. And we started with the premise that the Christian marriage is under attack. The Christian marriage is being assaulted. Because if the Christian marriage does not stand strong, then it's just another opportunity for this world and the enemy of Christianity to stand and to attack and to say, look what Jesus can't do, rather than a strong marriage that screams, look what Jesus can do. Look what he does in our lives. Look how, look how he unifies us. Look at the balance that he brings us. Look at the way that he glorifies himself in our lives. And so the Christian marriage is under attack. And we're going to look this morning at practical practices. Up to this point, we've looked at straight scripture, broken down things verse by verse. And we're going to look at biblical principles today. But we're also going to talk about just some reality, some experiential realities that I've been able to gain over a lot of years of doing premarital counseling and also postmarital counseling. And so today we're going to look at these practical practices and we're going to wrap this series up with some things that you can directly apply to your lives right now, today. And it'll be beneficial for those of you who are married and for those of you who someday want to be married. The benefits will be rich and you'll be able to uh, put some of this into your lifestyle and into your practice so that you can have a truly unified marriage that will glorify God. So let's pray, and then we're going to look right at this. And before I pray, there's no bulletins right now. We're having trouble figuring out how to get the new computer to print on the uh, on that copier. So you're just going to have to listen well and take notes maybe on a different piece of paper if you want to do so. So let's pray. Father God, I am thankful for today. I'm thankful for this series on growing and, and developing our marriages and making them stronger, Lord, so that you might receive maximum glory in our lives. Lord, I pray... For each of the marriages in this room, and I pray that you would just protect them, that you would guard them, that you'd watch over them. I pray that each of us who are married would not allow little things to become large, that we wouldn't get stuck on our own preferences, on our own selfishness, Lord, on our own desires, but we would truly always work toward the greater good of unity in marriage and, and in exalting you and glorifying you in all things in our marriage. For those who someday desire and have a passion to be married, I pray that, married, Lord, rather, I pray that you would just, Lord, help them to see the principles that it will take in order to have a strong marriage, in order to be preparing for that day, Lord, when you will bless them in that area. And, Lord, I just pray for all of us and in all of our relationships that we would seek you first, that we would truly just be desirous of, of bringing honor to your name, and, Lord, that we would want to do the right things, that we would want to obey you, and that we would want to express our love for you through obedience. We praise you and we glorify you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I want us to see the balancing act. And we're going to come back to the main text that we started the whole series on, which is Ephesians 5. We're going to start in verses 21 through 24. It says, Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And if you remember when we broke this down word by word and looked at it, we talked about the fact that it begins with verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. The Christian life is a life of submission for all of us one to another. We put others first. We honor others above ourselves. We submit to one another so that the other person's good is always exalted over our desires and passions. And so we submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then when it comes to spiritual headship, when it comes to spiritual leadership in the home, that role was clearly given to the husband. And we looked at these three verses, 22, 23, and 24, and we broke them down, and we saw the concept of what submission really means and what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that a wife is a doormat. It doesn't mean that she can't ever talk. It doesn't mean that she can't ever be involved in decision making. In fact, it's quite the opposite. She should be involved in decision making. She should have freedom to speak within the marriage relationship. But she also, at that point of decision making, if the husband, as the spiritual leader, is making a decision and is not asking her to sin in following him, she does have a role to follow. But I gave you the example in, in my marriage with Kelly. In all of our years, I can count on probably one hand the times where I've had to say, okay, we've talked about this, we still disagree, we can't come to an agreement, and we're just going to have to do it this way. That's not the norm. And it shouldn't be the norm unless you're running a dictatorship rather than a marriage. 
But if you're running a marriage and you're truly the spiritual leader of your home, nine times out of ten, as a couple, we should be able to resolve things by opening up the Bible and saying, let's look at this scripturally. Let's pray this through. Let's get some wise counsel and let's make a decision that's godly. But there is a time when a wife will need to follow a husband even though she disagrees with the leadership decision that he's making it. If it is not sin that she's being asked to do or to follow, she needs to follow. Submission does not always mean silence, but there is a time where it does mean silence. First Peter addresses that. We're not going to go there today. Submission comes through great communication, not in the absence of communication. I watch so many husbands these days that try and use the scriptures to justify their positions, and to them what it really means is that submission comes through silence. I said it, just do it. You know, our wives are not our children. Our wives are not somebody that we can just dictate to and command and demand. That's not the relationship that's given. Our wives are our partners in life. And why would we not want to do everything that we can to build them up and to lift them up? And why would we not want to discuss, discuss every decision that's made? Why would we not want to discuss everything that's going on in life and together come to the right conclusions? Again, I've watched many men in, in Christianity try and use this, these three verses right here as their justification for their wrongful behavior towards their wives. And that's not what it's talking about. Submission is the wives, the wife to give, not the husbands to demand. And we need to understand the difference in that. I can't demand submission. It's Kelly's to give because of her wanting to be pleasing to the Lord. I can tell her, here's what I believe God is leading us in, and this is the decision I'm making. But ultimately, it's still her choice as to whether she's going to follow that or not. It's still her freedom to make that choice and then to realize that there's consequences that come along with all of our choices. We need to understand the difference. And then communication doesn't only need to happen, but it needs to be understood. So often, again, in counseling situations over the years, I'll hear usually the husband say, but I said that already, or I told you that already. That doesn't mean it's understood. And sometimes we need to say things different ways in order for it to be understood. Jonathan had the, the opportunity to sit in a meeting um, with me on Friday at work. And I said the same thing probably, I would say, 20 different ways to try and get a point across. Because people were dug in saying something had to be a certain way. And so I tried it the first way. And they just kept saying stuck. And then I tried it a second way. And they were still stuck. I tried it a third way. And, they were, and it just went on and on. And they never got unstuck that day. Now, the next morning, I went to two other people in our company that I knew were involved in that decision, and I said, hey, we've got to talk about this. Let's look at it. And then it got corrected. But sometimes communication is not just simply saying this is what it is or this is what it isn't. It's saying it in different ways so that it can be understood and grasped. And that's all a part of submission. Let's talk about a couple experiential factors that come into our marriages. The first thing is the man and his bottom line. We have to understand that as men and women, we're made differently. And this is not an across-the-board truth, but it is truth on many and most occasions. A man generally wants to deal with the bottom line. Men are not very often detail-oriented. Not bad, just part of the way God made us, just part of our makeup. And so, for instance, when I come home from work, and I say, hey, how was your day, Kelly? I don't want to know everything she did between 8 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon or 5 in the afternoon. I, I don't care about all those details. I just want to know, was it good or bad? Was it good? Was it bad? That's good enough for me. Just give me the bottom line. And most men are generated that way, are made that way. You know, I also am sharing when Kelly asks, hey, how was your day? Well, it was great. That's good enough. That's all I really want to share. I don't want to go over every MRF that was submitted and every number, every serial number that was given throughout the day and everything. That, I don't want to go through all that. It was just a great day. And that's enough. And in general, men are made very bottom line oriented. Now, the woman is often detail oriented. And so when I come home and I say, hey, Kelly, how was your day? I literally can get a rundown of just about.
out every single second of the entire day in great detail. And I need to learn to listen to that. And so even though I asked the question, wanting a bottom line, God made our wives and made women in general to be detail-oriented. Can we see the conflict that quickly arises in those two differences? Because I end up in many counseling sessions where that is the bottom line that causes the conflict. And here's what we have to do. Every one of our marriages are unique. Every one of our marriages are different. Every one of our relationships are different. My marriage does not need to look like Jen and Chris's. Their marriage does not need to look like mine and Kelly. You know, Jonathan and Liz's marriage does not need to look like anybody else's. Kathy, your marriage does not need to look like anybody else's. It's a unique design where God takes two unique individuals and puts them together. Therefore, the marriage can be and should be unique. However, if we don't learn how to deal with these two differences, details, and bottom line effectively, we have problems. And there's a very easy solution to it. Kelly and I happen to apply it this way. It may not be the way that you apply it. <coughs> Kelly will come home, or I'll come home, and Kelly will say, how was your day? And I'll say, great. And I'm done right there. That was a good enough answer. And she'll say, well, can you tell me more about that? And I'll say sometimes, no, I can't. I don't have the time right now. Now, early in our marriage, I couldn't get away with just saying, no, I don't have time right now because we were learning how to relate to each other. But here's what Kelly's learned. If I say no to her in that moment, there's a reason I'm saying no. And she also knows that I'll come back to her nine times out of ten later on in the evening and say, hey, you wanted to know about my day. I'm done doing what I had to do now. I'll share with you in detail what that looks like. The flip side also occurs. There's times where, you know, I'll say, hey, Kelly, how was your day? And she'll say, right down the list of, eat that, and I'll say, stop. I don't have time for that right now. I have to do this. And she can accept that now within our experience of the years we have together because, again, she knows that I'm going to come back to her and I'm going to say, okay, I'm ready to hear your details now. And we've been able to make that work for us. You don't have to make it work that way for you. The opposite is also true. There's times when I don't feel like listening to details, and I need to. Because that's important to my wife. And if she's important to me, then her details need to be important to me. But as a woman and a man, we're made differently. And somehow, we've got to find a solution to this, because one of two things are going to happen. We are either going to grow through our differences in the way God made us and truly grow together and be stronger because of our differences or we will have forever lasting conflict. And we need to learn how to work through that. I can tell you the growth option is better than the conflict option, but I've just learned that some people just love conflict. And that somehow they get some sick satisfaction in their marriage out of constantly having conflict. And, and I just don't understand that, but it happens over and over and over again. So will you choose in details and bottom line, will you choose a path that works for the two of you, that brings about growth and strength rather than conflict? While we're on this subject, I want to talk about fighting fair, fighting fairly. You know, there's a right way and a wrong way that we can have differences in our marriage and still be okay. We are going to have differences. And there's ways that we can handle it that will glorify God even in the midst of our differences. And there's ways that we can handle it that will dishonor Him in those differences. Differences, how many of us realize that differences are going to occur? It happens. It happens in all of our relationships. But how we handle it will dictate the outcome. And here's some rules that I like to apply and that I like to teach when it comes to how do you fight in a marriage in a manner that still will be honoring to God. The first thing is, don't make any always or never statements. They're extreme and they're rarely ever true. You never, you always, she always, he always, he never, she never. Don't go there. Because it's very rare that something can be blanketed with an always and never statement. And when we get defensive or when we get angry, we often default to always and never. And those are hurtful statements. Because again, they're very rarely true. So don't go to always, don't go to never. Don't go to the past. Don't 
go to the past. Well, every time this has happened before, you did this or that or handled it this way. Are we not to give the benefit of the doubt to our spouse, the most important person on this earth in our life? Should we not give them the benefit of the doubt that they're growing just like we're growing in our walk with the Lord? And so even though they may have handled it horribly two months ago, should we not give them the benefit of the doubt that they're not going to handle it horribly this time? Would we not expect that grace in return in our lives when we're handling things poorly? Don't go to the past. Don't bring that back up. When we truly forgive our, our spouse in a situation in our relationship, that's supposed to be done. The word forgiveness really entails the concept of not held against their account. It's no longer in the mix. It's out forever. It's done with. But so often, when we get in the middle of a conflict and turmoil, the first thing we do is go back. And we pull all that stuff back up, and it's damaging and damning even for our relationships. Another way in fighting is we, we don't need to raise our voices and yell and holler. And there's just there's no need for it. Have I done it? Yes. Is it right? No. There's no need. I've learned that if I have to raise my voice to get a result that I want out of my wife or out of my children, I'm probably not leading very well. I mean, I can force them because I'm physically stronger and bigger to do whatever I want them to do. But if I'm loving them rightly, I'll never have to force them to do anything. I can love them rightly, I don't have to yell, I don't have to holler, I don't have to lose my cool, and the truth of the matter is the last fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Now I'm not saying that there's never a time to be strong in statements. I'm not saying that there's never a time to be direct. You all know me better than that. I mean, there's a time to be direct. There's a time to say something strongly and firmly, but you also know there's a fine line between saying something direct and screaming at somebody. There's a fine line between saying something direct and being out of control and yelling. And we need to balance that. There's no need for that in our marital relationships. No pretensions about motivations. This is a tough one. And this is destructive in marriages. Kathy will say something to Mark and Mark will say, I think you really mean this. Or... She'll say something to Mark and it'll cause conflict and he'll say something in response to her motivations. I'm trying to think of a specific example of this and I can't, one's not coming to my mind. I might say to Kelly, hey Kelly, you know what, I need you to do this. And she'll say, well what you're really trying to say, no, I said what I'm trying to say. We cannot have a pretense about what somebody's motivation is. All we can know is what their actions say. They said this, let's take them at their word. And stop going to, I think you really meant, or I think this is what you were trying, I'm not trying to say anything, this is what I'm saying. I've said what I was trying to say. I didn't have a problem with it. I said it. So let's not jump to motivations of the heart, because when we start going down the road of what we think they meant, that's where the scripture comes into play that deals with judging. I can judge your actions, and you can judge mine, and we're commanded to, but we're not commanded to judge our thoughts and our pretensions, our motivations, rather. That's a pretense. That's something we're bringing into the situation that may or may not be real. And the last thing, when you're in a fight or an argument in your marriage, is no shots below the belt. Don't go to hurtful, ugly statements. Anybody here ever do it, other than me? You take that shot that you shouldn't have taken, and you regret it, but it's come out. It's out of the mouth. The damage is already done. You've said what you shouldn't have said. And so often, that is not only an occurrence that takes place once in a while, but so often in our marriages, it becomes the pattern where we revert to name-calling or accusations or just stupid statements that really aren't true. And thankfully, God's gracious and He helps us to work through the other side of that when it occurs. But you know, the more often it occurs, the greater the damage and the longer lasting that the damage is because then we grow callous and we start thinking, is this really what you think about me? Is this really how you view me? And so don't take those nasty statements. Don't put them out there. Bite your tongue. And remember, whatever it is that you're arguing about, how many times have you got done with the argument and two weeks later you don't even remember what you were arguing about? But yet we said hateful and hurtful things that have done damage that lasts. 
So let's learn to fight fairly. That's the first point. The second point that I want to cover this morning is called significance and security. So we looked at the balancing act in our relationship. Let's look at significance and security. And I'm going to read to you a couple scriptures, and I want to show you how I think this takes place. In Ephesians 5 and verse 33, it says, However, each one of you must also love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Now, that word respect deals with respect, honor, and edification, encouragement, build up. Okay, so the wife must respect her husband. Now, the first thing is, as husbands, we need to live a life that's worthy of respect. Because respect is something that is freely given by the wife, but it's also something that's earned. It's not just something that automatically is given, but we earn respect by taking rightful actions and by loving our wife. What came in the nine verses, or the seven verses, rather, before this one. That's how they learn to respect us, because we, we honor them rightly and love them rightly. But I believe that deep inside of a man, as God made us up, is there's this need for significance. There's this need for significance in life in general. But I can tell you, if I preach a message and 10 people come up and say, hey, that was a great message. Or if I do something at home that people see or, or I write something and people say that was a great article. Or, that's all good and encouragement is good from others. But it's never quite as important as if Kelly says it. It never quite means as much as if my wife, my helpmeet in life, says it. And I believe that if, as wives, if you learn to understand that if you build up the significance of your husband, if you honor him, and if you respect him, if you edify him, if you encourage him, it will benefit you greatly. Because somewhere inside, in God's design of our lives, he made us in a manner that we respond to being made valuable or significant. Now, I'll tell you, there's something else that comes into this. You can't lie and fake it because we know it. So if you're saying, hey, hubby, I think you're great, and you're really not meaning it, we get that. We know that, and that kind of defeats the purpose. But as wives, you should be looking for the opportunity to build up your husband. And to tell him, not about all the negative stuff that you see, you can address that when it comes up, but build him up, and I guarantee you will be the direct beneficiary of that. That's not why you do it, but you do it because the scriptures clearly say the wife must respect, must honor, must edify her husband. And if you put this into practice, I am telling you the results will be returned to you. So often... And it's so discouraging to me. I see wives just tear their husbands down. And it's bad enough that they do it oh, when they're alone. That's bad enough. But I watch them do it publicly. And it's disgraceful. They'll cut their husband down in front of other people. And they'll tear him down and basically say he's a bum in front of other people. And these are in Christian relationships, and I'm thinking, my goodness, man, first of all, why do you deal with that and not get that straightened out? You're weak, you're a coward, get that taken care of on the man's side of the house. But on the, the lady's side of the house, I'm thinking, do you not understand what that's doing? And the return that you're going to get from tearing your husband down, it is not going to be positive. Let me just tell you, nothing good is going to come out of you publicly disgracing your husband. <clears throat> And yet, within Christianity, I've watched wives do it over and over and over again. I can tell you this. Nobody in my life will confront me and, and stand up to me as much as Kelly does. Nobody. There's nobody who consistently will stand and tell me the way things are as much as Kelly does. But I can guarantee you she has never one time in our entire 19 plus years of marriage, never one time has she publicly disgraced me. It has never happened. She has never brought up an issue in those years of marriage in front of other people that had to do with her and I. Never. It has never happened in a public setting. Because she understands this scripture. She understands the concept of respect and honor. And she understands that one of her primary roles is to build me up in the area of value and significance. And that has never happened. Ever. And I'd encourage you as wives to not allow that to happen. Not that she's never had reason for it to happen. There's times.
times where I've been an idiot. And she would have been right by saying, Matt, you're an idiot. But she didn't do it there. She waited until we got home. And then she said, Matt, you're an idiot. And dealt with it there in a private setting. So just think about it because our words matter. Our words matter. The entire chapter of James chapter 3 deals with our words. So respect, honor, and edification. Now deep inside of our wives and inside of ladies is this need for security. There's this need for security. Look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 33. It says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That's a pretty high standard. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. How did Christ love the church? Well, first of all, sacrificially, he died on the cross for her. Secondly, with great honor, he, he exalted the church. He became head over the church. So it was sacrificial. It was deep. It was serious. It was significant in the commitment that he made. He made her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In that same way, do you see those principles? Blameless, holy, that's what we're supposed to be building up in our wives. In the same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And we broke this all down, so I'm not going to go too in-depth on it. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church. For we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. The two will become one flesh. This is a profound a mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you must love his wife as, in, as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. What does that have to do with security? I have never met a Christian woman that is married, that is striving to be godly, that when she is loved properly, does not handle her relationship with her husband rightly. The issue of submission is never an issue for a godly wife that's loved properly. It's just not. It's not even an issue. It doesn't even need to be spoken. It naturally happens because she knows how deeply she is loved. Husbands, if you want to see things take off with your wife, if you want to see your wife brightly relate to you, if you want to see your wife just shine in every area of life, build her up in the area of security. I believe the number one factor that I have faced over all the years of counseling that I've done, post-marital counseling, I believe the number one factor that drives most of the issues that we have on the wife side of the house, on the lady's side of the house, it comes back to insecurity. It does. It comes back to insecurity. If she is insecure in your relationship, if she is insecure about your provision, if she is insecure about the house and the home and the way that you're living, if she is insecure about you, you've got a disaster on your hands. And it will not be easily changed. But if you build her up and if you show her how secure things are by action and by words, your marriage will shine. And you will never have a problem with her respecting you. You will never have a problem with her honoring you. You will never have a problem with her building you up and edifying you because she will feel a sense of security that you're providing. If you want things to fall apart, let her think things are insecure. And things will fall apart rapidly. Just like she was made to be detail-oriented, she was made with a sense of a need for security. And you are God's tool to provide that. I get that ultimately all she needs is her Father in Heaven. I get that. I understand that. And that should be enough. But I understand also that the real factor is how you as a husband, provide for her security. How you make her feel like the world can fall down around her and it's not going to matter because you've got her taken care of. She knows and she trusts that you have her first. She knows and she trusts that you've got it all taken care of. Even if deep inside she knows it's not taken care of, she trusts that you'll find a way and figure it out and take care of her. Security is the best thing 
as husbands that we can give to our wives because it speaks to the love of Christ. It speaks to the love that's described in these scriptures. So if we're providing as men security for our wives, and if our wives are striving to make us significant in life, you know what that equals? A harmonious marriage. Unity in marriage. I can almost always come back to these two factors when we're dealing with counseling and marriage. And if one of them's broken down, I can tell you they'll both be broken down. Because if she's not feeling secure, she's not going to be building you up. And if you're not built up, you're not going to be providing verbally and in action the security that you need to. And it becomes this endless circle of breakdown and confusion and battle. And it doesn't need to be that way. So significance and security. The last point I want to share with you today in a practical manner are the hindrances. What are the hindrances to marriages over and over and over again that cause us problems? If we can conquer this list, we'll have great marriages. If we cannot conquer this list, our marriages will be a disaster. And there's going to be nobody who is not in Christ looking in and saying, boy, I want to have that. In fact, they'll be saying quite the opposite. Why in the world would I need Jesus if this is what a Christian marriage looks like? Do you recognize the importance of our Christian marriages in the scope of our mission of seeing other people come to Christ? Our marriages are the greatest example that people can see of what a right relationship is supposed to look like. Now again, our marriages are unique. They look differently. It only has to work for the two of you. It doesn't have to work for anyone else. But we've got to work at these principles so that it does work for the two people who are married. So it does work for your relationship. And so people can say there's something different about them. And start wondering what is it that's different. The difference is Christ in our lives. That's why our marriages are so different. The first hindrance that has to be overcome, we touched on it, but it's the past. It's the past. Ecclesiastes 3.15 says, What is has already been, and what will be has been before, and God will call the past to account. You see, it's God who deals with what's happened in the past, not us. I have no right if I've forgiven Kelly for some past transgression that she's had against me. I have no right digging it back up ever again. And if I truly understand just how deep the sin can be in my life when it takes a hold of me and the wrong that I can do, and if I understand the grace God has given me, why would I ever want to dig something up from her past? Why would I ever want to dig something up that she's done wrong in the past when I know God has covered my sin with His love and with His grace and with His mercy? You know why we dig that up? Why we go back to their past? Because we think we're better than them. That's why we do it. We actually think somehow that we're more spiritual, that we're better, that we've got it more together, and so we attack their past as if we don't have one, as if we've not blown it in the past. Look at this next scripture, Matthew 12, verse 36 and 37. But I tell you that men will have to give account on the day of judgment for every careless word they have spoken. For by your words you will be acquitted, and by your words you will be condemned. Is that not enough? Is it not enough that we have to give an account to our Lord Jesus Christ for every careless word that leaves our mouth? Do we really need to hold on and continue to bring up the past when we've sinned against each other in our marriages? The answer is no. We need to forgive it and let it go. We need to not hold it to their account anymore. And let me bring in one more component about the past. Sometimes... Marriages that I've been dealing with are 15 and 20 years down the road. They've been married that long, and they're still dealing with garbage that occurred before they were even married. With the past of their spouse. Let it go. Let it go. If we have things in our past that we're not proud of and that the Lord has forgiven us, don't keep bringing that up within your marriage. Let it go. It's over, and it's not going to do anything in the area of significance and security that we just talked about by bringing it back up over and over again. In fact, it's, going to, it's just going to bring disaster to your marriage. First hindrance is the past. Here's the second hindrance, the future. The future. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. 
How many of us know that's true? Second verse is in James. Now listen, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city and spend a year there, carry on business and make money. Why, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Folks, worry is sin. It's sin. It is a lack of faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and His sovereign plan for our lives. Worry is based in fear, and fear is the opponent and the direct opposition to faith. And when we worry, we need to own it as what it is, as sin, confess it, and say, Lord, help me have the strength to not worry. Give me the encouragement. Give me the strength to not worry. I deal with future in marital counseling all the time. And I sit and watch couples fight over what ifs that are coming maybe five years down the road or ten years down the road. What if? What if? Who cares? What if? We might not even be alive tomorrow. Why are we worried about what's going to go on five years down the road? If ifs and buts were candies and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Who cares about that? We can't control the what ifs. What we can control is today. And we don't need to let the future damn our today. We don't need to allow the future to make us ineffective and ineffective today. Let's not let the future control our present. Let's not let the past control our present. I spend an immense amount of time dealing with the hindrances of the past and the present. I mean the past and the future in the present in people's marriages. There's no need. Don't get consumed with either. What about pride? What about pride? This is the heart. In particularly, although I see it definitely with women, it really drives a man in the area of conflict is the issue of pride. Look at what Proverbs has to say about it. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. I hate pride and arrogance, evil behavior, and perverse speech. He hates it. When pride comes, then comes disgrace. But with humility comes wisdom. Pride, in Proverbs 13, only breeds quarrels, but wisdom is found in those who take advice. Proverbs 16, pride goes before destruction and haughty speech and, and a haughty spirit before a fall. And then in Proverbs 29, it says this, A man's pride brings him low, but a man of lowly spirit gains honor. Pride is destructive in a marriage. If I dig in over something wrong and I want to hold my ground, the only thing that's going to come out of it is damage. That's all that's going to come out of it. Pride in a man's heart is an awful thing. And I could have brought out another 30 Proverbs that deal with the issue of pride. And we need to set our pride aside and in humility consider others better than ourselves. In humility honor others above ourselves. In humility submit to one another. Out of the fear of the Lord. We need to submit to one another. We need to honor one another. We need to exalt one another. And pride does the opposite of all of that. If we don't get pride under control in our marriages, we will never be able to resolve conflict. It's a great hindrance. Selfishness. This is at the core of every hindrance. I really believe that. In fact, I believe selfishness is at the core of all sin. It really is. It's at the very heart of all sin. Let's look at a few scriptures. Galatians 5. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity and debauchery, idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you as I did before that those who live like, that, like this, and, and understand that's talking about the general pattern of life, those who live with a general pattern of life like this list will not inherit the kingdom of God because they are proving that they truly don't know Him. If that's the general practice of life, it is just exposing that you truly don't know Him. Selfish ambition. It has no role in our lives. In Philippians 2, verses 3 and 4, it says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Nothing. But in humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Again, 
Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. And the last point is in James chapter 3. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition, in other words, if you're holding selfishness deep to your heart, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, see its source of the devil. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and every evil practice. When we have selfishness within the core of our marriage, by the wife or the husband, there we will find every evil practice. It will turn everything upside down. It will rot away your marriage from the very core of our being. It's what we talked about last week when we talked about truly putting our spouse first. Selfishness is what prevents it. We are driven by selfishness. Our culture drives selfishness. Our sinful nature drives selfishness. It has to be a conscious choice to overcome selfishness if we want to have victory in our marriages. And then here, unwillingness to reconcile. It's the second last um, issue that I want to look at that are repetitive in marriages. Unwillingness to reconcile. This is the one that truly at the core ends up destroying the marriage. Destroys it. This is the only thing. How many of you recognize we're going to do stupid and, and ignorant things to each other? Anybody recognize that? Other than me? Anybody here ever do something really stupid towards your spouse? Say something stupid, do something stupid. You ever do that? If you're not, you're lying right now. So let's get that right too. It happens. We do it. But this is what destroys it. It's not the stupid thing you did. It's the stupid thing you do by continuing to not forgive it when it's occurred to you. Unforgiveness is the one factor that will ultimately destroy a marriage. And an unwillingness to reconcile. How many of you recognize that there's nothing that we can't overcome in a marriage? Nothing. I have watched people walk through everything and anything over these years. Destructive things that have occurred in their marriage and because they were willing to reconcile and forgive, they overcame it. They overcame it. There is nothing that we can't have victory over. It doesn't matter how bad it is. It doesn't matter how awful it was. You can still have victory over it if you're willing to reconcile. Here's what the scripture says. Matthew 6 verses 14 and 15. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. How awful is that? We hold things against our spouse. The most dear relationship that we're given, given in this life, the most important relationship that we have in this life, and we hold stuff against them, somehow in our warped minds, thinking that that's actually going to help. And yet, God says in His Word, if we don't forgive, we don't receive forgiveness. That's what it says. We need to forgive. And not only do we need to forgive, we need to forgive quickly. Quickly. The Bible speaks elsewhere about not letting the sun go down on your anger. It doesn't mean everything's resolved, but it means you've resolved it at least to a point where the anger is gone and you're going to move forward and deal with it in a right manner. In Matthew 18, it says, If your brother sins against you, go and show him his fault just between the two of you. Why do we think that that doesn't apply to our marriages? It does. If I sin against Kelly, I can tell you what, she's going to tell me about it. She's going to say, Matt, you're wrong and that's sinful. Get it right. And then I have a choice to make. Will I get it right or won't I? And then she has a choice to make when I do get it right. Will she forgive it or won't she? And so often, this is where marriages get stuck. Right here. And an unwillingness to reconcile. And you know what? Sometimes it's not even the big things that we do wrong to each other. Sometimes it's little stupid stuff that we hold on to. And we sabotage our own marriages because of being unwilling to forgive. And in John 20, verse 23, it says, If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. And that's just talking about the application and the freedom that we can actually give to one another 
in Christ by learning to forgive one another. How many of you, when somebody truly forgives you, do not just you just don't feel free? You know it was wrong. You know it was sin. You've got it right with the Father. But when they say, especially when it's your spouse, when they say, it's okay, I forgive you. Does it not just set you free? Does it not just take you over that hilltop and you just start to see the victory in your relationship again? We need to forgive quickly and we need to grant forgiveness quickly. We need to receive forgiveness quickly and we need to build up quickly on the backside of forgiveness. We are going to sin against each other. In fact, the closer the relationship, the more obvious and the more apparent our sin becomes and the more it's experienced. We need to be quicker in our marriages than any other relationship to forgive, to let it go, and forget about it. And if we don't, it will ultimately mean the destruction of our marriages or, at the very best, it will just mean a miserable life. Why do you want to live a miserable life? It blows me away that people stay married for 20 and 30 years and live miserably. Staying married is right. But stay married and get some victory in your life. Enjoy it. Why would you want to live miserably? It is a choice. There is a choice involved. And we can have it either way. The last thing I'm going to touch on is others' involvement. It's one of the greatest hindrances. And this is just a precaution. I don't have a scripture to go with it. But I can tell you this. One of the greatest destructions that I've seen is when partners in a marriage get other people involved in their internal affairs. Destruction. Period. And you know when it's worse? When they go to mommy and daddy. That's when it really gets bad. In all the years of our marriage, I have never ever, and Kelly has never ever, taken our problem to our families. Ever. Ever. It is destructive. Because here's what happens. Kelly sins against me, and I go to my mom and dad and say, can you believe she did that? She gets it right with me and we're okay. Guess who's still holding on to it? Mom and dad. Brother and sister. Best friend. Why do we take our internal affairs outside of the marriage relationship? It is sacred. It is special. And there's no need to take it anywhere unless you can't get it resolved. And if you can't get it resolved, then where should you take it? to somebody who is wise and trustworthy, not to the world. Has anybody ever experienced that in a relationship when somebody sins against you and you've gotten it right and it's okay, but because you shared it with others, they never ever view them the same. They hold it against them because for some reason they think they have to defend you. Don't take your garbage to other people. And if you have to, Take it to somebody wise that you can trust who is truly going to help you reconcile it and not hold it against your spouse. Well, I hope that's helpful stuff to end things up. I wanted to end with some very practical stuff, some very matter-of-fact things that we can apply to our life. I know this, that a good marriage is a choice. Every one of our marriages can be good, just like every one of our marriages can be bad. And the only two people who choose what our marriage looks like are the two that are in marriage. And we can change it today. If it hasn't been great, make a choice to make it great. If it hasn't been wonderful, make a choice to make it wonderful. If it's been bad, make a choice to make it good. And if it's built in unforgiveness, forgive and move forward because it's not getting anywhere. And know this, that the life we have is often a result of the choices we've made. And those can change and we can reestablish a right relationship and a right marriage that we can enjoy for the rest of our lives. So let's bomb-proof our marriage by supplying and using God's good wisdom that he's given us in the word of God so that he can be glorified. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you for letting us look at our marriages, and I pray for the marriages in this, in this congregation, in the church plan at Grand Junction. I pray that you protect us, that you would watch over us. I pray you'd convict us to the heart if we're not dealing rightly in our marriages, if we're exhibiting anger towards our spouse, if, we're, if we have unforgiveness or bitterness, if we're being selfish, Lord, whatever it is that we're doing, I pray you'd convict us to the heart and that we would respond by getting it right. Lord, I pray that our marriages would be examples to all those that are looking in at our lives. 
and that people would see you in us and in our marriage relationships. Again, Lord, I ask that you protect our marriages, watch over them, and glorify yourself. In Jesus' name.